Hello, friends. Um, it is Wednesday, the 24th of March. And it's uh, a little after 1 o'clock, and it's a dark and kind of damp day and spring day in Salem, Virginia, very warm outside. And, um, it's a In its own way, it's a beautiful day. And I hope things are well with you as we approach Holy Week, uh, beginning uh, this coming Sunday with Palm Sunday. Uh, you'll recall that last week we had we finished the uh, story of uh, Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. Uh, we begin now with the twelfth uh, verse. Uh, remember that uh, Jesus asked the woman caught in adultery, "Where are they? Has no one condemned you?" And she said, "No one, sir." And Jesus said, "Neither do I condemn you. Go." your way, and from now on, do not sin again. Um, and in the rest of this chapter, which we're going to be looking at now, the remainder of chapter 8, I hope that we can get through the whole thing because it's really rather redundant. <clears throat> um, Jesus is uh, talking to people that want to condemn him. And the conflict with uh the Jewish authorities is getting ready to boil over, and it continues to get 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 hotter and hotter. Uh, and in this controversy, John, the writer John, is trying to use this controversy to explicate, to um, define, to uh, characterize for the reader that is us, uh, the distinction between the religious, the religious authorities, the religious elites of Palestinian Judaism, of Judean Judaism, um, and Jesus. Uh, you will recall that it is always best when you study the Gospel of John to go back to the first chapter. And we will see this in abundance in what we have left here in the 8th chapter. Let us pray. Lord, be with us, guide us, and help us. And may we see you through the scripture by your Holy Spirit as you truly are. Amen. So Jesus is, after this encounter with the woman who is caught in adultery, and this makes this delineation between the Pharisaic judgment and Jesus' judgment very clear. We talked about it at, at length, perhaps more than we should have last, uh, last week. And this week we're going to talk about what that conflict is really about. As you recall, when in the Gospel of John, when Jesus has an encounter with someone, uh, then he spends, in, in John's gospel, there's this story and there's this conflict or there's this uh, uh, event, and then John spends the rest of that chapter or some time uh, having Jesus explain the metaphorical, symbolic significance of the event. So, that's where we are. We've had this event, and now Jesus spoke to them. Who is them? Well, I take it that them are, are the, uh, the Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees. Uh, he spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of light the light of life. Uh, what in the world is he talking about? Well, well, let's let's see what he's talking about. If we go back to the first chapter and we begin with the prologue, the first verses, uh, verse uh, uh, four, or th last half of three and four, what has come into being in him, that is the word, that is 
Christ, that is the revealing of God in the Son, excuse me, Phew. what has come into being in him was life, and, that, and the life, that is his life, was the light of all people. And the light shines in the darkness and has not overcome it. Okay. Uh, that's what he's talking about. That he is a light in the darkness. That he is the revealing of God. That people walk in darkness, as Isaiah said. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. That the light is the revealing of God in the world in Christ. He says, I am the light of the world. I'm the one that is sent to reveal the Father's will. The world, the world that you and I inhabit, does not know the will of God, does not see God, does not trust God, does not walk in the light of God's presence, right? I mean, is, is, isn't that clear? And you and I, you and I, we often do not see that light and do not, often do not walk in that light. We walk in semi-darkness most a lot of the time. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, now what does that mean, whoever follows me? That means whoever walks in my way, whoever follows my footsteps, whoever does the things that I do, whoever sees me as their captain in life, whoever their king, their lord, whoever seeks to conform their life, their way, their truth, their life to the way and the truth and the life of Jesus. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness because you won't be bereft of the hope, faith, love of God. Whoever walks in the darkness will have the light. Will, whoever walks, follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Inasmuch as we walk and, and follow Christ, we don't walk in darkness. Now, that's not to say that we know everything that we need to know. That's not to say that we don't have problems. That's not to say that we don't sometimes feel that God is absent. That is not so at all. Oftentimes, the, the harder we seek to follow Christ, the more absent he seems to be. At least that's my experience. But if we walk in that light, what remains? Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. We walk in that light, then we know, then, then, we, then, then we don't walk in darkness. Darkness comes from the turning within. As long as you're following Christ, you're not turning within, you're turning outward. Because follow Christ means I'm going to love God and love my neighbor no matter what the cost. All right? That's what to follow Christ means. I'm going to love God and love my neighbor that my, that my um, uh, 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 reason for living is not to feed my ego. My reason for living is not to satisfy myself. It's to be, the, my, my, my job is to be self-forgetful. Not necessarily to be in self-denial as, as much as it is to be self-forgetting in the process of loving God and loving neighbor. And if we do that, we'll always be in the light that, 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 and not in the darkness because we'll always be turning outward, always be turning outward. And as we turn outward, we walk in the light. As we turn inward, things get dark like a black hole. And then the Pharisees said to him, it's it, crazy now, so they don't understand what he's talking about. They don't understand what he's talking about. And, and, and the Pharisees said to him, um, you are testifying on your own behalf. Your testimony is not valid. In other words, it doesn't do it. Just because you say you're the light of life doesn't make it so. You have to have two witnesses in, un, under Jewish law. Somebody has to verify what you're saying. Just because you say that you're the light of life and that anybody who follows you will never walk in darkness, that doesn't mean you know what you're talking about. That doesn't mean that you're not 
uh, crazy or a liar. Does it, how, how, why should we believe you? And Jesus answered, even if I do testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid because I know where I've come from and I know where I'm going, but you don't know where I come from or where I'm going. And what does that mean? Well, that means he comes from God, right? He comes from God. Let's go back to the first chapter. He's the one that God has sent. He's the word made flesh. You judge by human standards. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is valid, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In other words, as we've pointed out before, this uh, it seems sometimes that Jesus in John is not very human. But on the other hand, in John, there is this very distinct uh, um, separation, not separation, uh, very distinct particularity uh, between God and and Christ, uh, the Father and and Christ the Son. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is valid. Jesus said, "So you got to have two witnesses to make it valid." Well, I'm going to tell you about my two witnesses. Uh, I testify on my own behalf. That's one, and the Father who sent me testifies on my behalf. That's two. So I have two test. I have two witnesses. The Father who sent me and myself. And then they said to him, Well then well, where is your father? Looking around, see where his daddy is, so he can so he can verify his testimony. And Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. And he spoke these words while he was teaching in the treasury of the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. I don't know that they understood him, what he was saying at this point. But what he's saying is that, that you don't understand me because I'm not of this world. I'm not of, you don't understand me because you don't see me for who I am. Not that I'm not of this world. Uh, I, that I'm not that you don't understand who I am and where I came from. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. Chapter 1, verse 10. Again, he said to them, I am going away and you will search for me, but you, but you won't find me. You will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. And then the Jews said, uh, uh, is he going to kill himself? Is he going to commit suicide? Is that what he means by saying, where I'm going, you cannot come? And of course, that's not what he meant. What he meant was that in, in a few days, he was going to be crucified and that he would ascend to the Father. And he said to them, you are from below, and I am from above. Now, you know, I, I, I don't know what you want to make of that. Uh, when, I, when I die, and uh, I might find out that uh, the devil and hell and the dominion of evil is below, literally, physically, location-wise, directionally, uh, below, and that heaven and God and the angels are above, uh, literally. Literally. But I think it's more figurative. I don't really believe in that uh, heaven and hell or the place of the dead are up and down. But Jesus is talking about metaphorically. He says, um, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. That's why you don't understand what I, where I'm going, you see. I told you that you would die in your sins, for you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. He being who? The Messiah, the one sent of God. And they said, but they don't understand that. I am he. What do you mean I am he? And they said, who are you? What are you talking about? So you understand what's happening here. Is John, the author of this letter, do you see this? Or am I just be am I beating a dead horse? Is he, why, why this dialogue? Because John wants to 
reiterate over and over and over and over what he said in the first chapter. And people don't understand him, and they say, what are you talking about? Who are you? He says, you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. Well, what does that mean? What would you think if somebody said that to you? That I am he, I am he, I am who? And so they ask, who are you? And, and, and the reason that John does this, uses this literary device, is he wants to say over and over and over and over again who he is, who this Jesus is, according to his purpose laid out in the first chapter. Jesus said, why do I speak to you at all? I have much to say about you and much to condemn, but the one who sent me, that is God, is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. I am the mouthpiece, the word, get it? The mouthpiece, the word made flesh. I declare what I have heard from him. I am the one who speaks the word of that is given me by the Father. They did not understand that he was speaking to them about the Father. I declare to the world what I have heard from him, but they didn't know what he was talking about. And he said, and he, he said um, they did not understand that he was speaking to them about the Father, so Jesus said, in order to further explicate what's going on, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, that is Christ, then you will realize that I am He, that is the Son of Man. And I do nothing on my own, but I speak these things as the Father has instructed me. And the one who sent me, that is God, is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what is pleasing to Him. And as, I was, and as he was saying this, many believed in him. So as he, as he, in John's gospel, tells people who he is, many believe, but some will not. That's always the way it is. That's what John's trying to say. Many people are going to believe in him as he tells them who he is and what it means, but there are going to be some, particularly the religious elites, that will not believe. And then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. If you continue in my word, what does that mean? If you, if you, if you continue in, what, in the truth that I'm speaking, if you continue in it, if you, if you really be, truly continue in being a follower and learning of me, then you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. There's that great verse. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Pilate will ask, what is truth? You, if you follow me, will know if you continue in my word, if you get to know me better all the time, you will know the truth, and the truth will set me free, set you free. Now, what does that mean? Say, what do you think that means? Well, free from the slavery of sin. See, free to the slavery of self. If you don't know the truth that Christ is bringing forward, what do you think? Quite naturally. You think, the natural person thinks that the truth is this life is about me being comfortable. This life is about me having what I want. This life is about me managing my affairs well. This life is about me being significant. This life is about me being well thought of. This world life is about me having power over others. This world life is about me doing good. It, it you know... That's the natural way to think about things. And that that natural way is selfish. It's all about me. Managing things on my behalf. Even for people that I love. Because my love is about me. I love people for what they do for me. Make me how they make me feel. 
Jesus says that to follow that path is to be a slave of myself, of my sin. And that's the way of darkness, that as I turn into turn, everything comes this way, and my love becomes perverted, and my power becomes, I, it comes I come to the point where I will do anything to get what I want. And that I will be, that I will be corrupted as I gain more and more, the more I am corrupted. The more success I have in pulling things to myself, in grasping things to myself, the more corrupt my heart will become and the darker my, my heart will become. That's what Jesus said. And, and he says the truth is that you, that you must turn outward, that life is about loving God and loving neighbor. Life is about, life is about giving oneself away in, in the service of Christ. That's the truth. That's the truth of which he's speaking. If you continue in my word, that if you continue listening to me, if you continue following in my way, truth and life, then you are truly my disciples and what will happen? You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That practice will become your life of giving yourself away, of, of, of going that way and not this way, okay? And as you do that, you will be freed from this desire, from this need to have everything. And guess what happens? Guess what happens? You don't have this need to be secure in your circumstances. We all have that need, but that need will become less and less and less. What's that great old song? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of the world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and praise. Well, you know, that's an old sentimental song. That's a great old song. And, and, and what we're saying here, you know, may be far more profound than that, but really that's another way of saying the same thing, that as we turn our eyes upon Jesus, as we follow in his way and his truth, as we, as we continue in his word, as he says, we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. We walk with him, we abide in him, and we find the truth to come to us. And we are set free from our need, our addiction to following ourselves and to feeding that ego that is ours. Feed, feed, feed that ego. The thing is that ego never gets full. If, 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 and it's so easy to let that pride and that ego let it take a hold of us. All it takes is one person to flatter us when we weren't expecting it. And all of a sudden, we just, you know, we just give me a little more. Tell me a little more about how great I am. And, and Jesus is saying, let go of that. It's nice to be complimented. Yeah, it's great. And nobody, everybody loves a compliment. That's fine. But when it when when it comes to, when we come to the point where we're looking for that and living for that, then we're then then we begin to play act for other people, you see, and then we begin to dislike people that don't respond to us in in a particular way, right? And so we become slaves to that need for our to feed our ego, and that's what he's talking about here. He says, you can be free from that. How do you be free from that? Well, you become self-forgetful. And how do you become self-forgetful? You walk in his word. You follow in his steps. You live in love of God and neighbor. And you forget about, not immediately, but over time, over years, over a lifetime, you learn that you don't need all that stuff for yourself. None of us ever learn it completely. But that's the secret. That's what sets us free. And they answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and we have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? They don't see? Once again, John see John just does this over and over and over again. It's one thing to say you're made you're set free in Christ. Well, what does that mean? That don't, I don't understand it. 
Tell us, John. Tell us, Jesus. What do you mean? And Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Yep. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are descendants of Abraham, yet you look for an opportunity to kill me because there is no place in you for my word. No, my word is an affront to you. My word is that all of the things that you think are so important religiously are not as important as trusting in me, believing in me that the Father sent me and that, and that it is to be expressed in the love of God and neighbor and not in all the things that you do. You look for the opportunity to kill me because there is no place in you for my word. I declare, I de I declare what my word is. My word is really the Father's world, word. I have... I declare what I have seen in the Father's presence. Huh. Wow. I declare what I have seen in the Father's presence. In other words, maybe there is something to this Trinity business, right? Maybe he has been in the Father's presence. Maybe he's not, maybe he is the pre existent Christ. Maybe these persons, distinct persons, I, I, you know, I don't tend to think of it that way. I tend to think of it, as you've heard me say more often than you probably care to, that, that the way I think about Jesus is the first chapter of John, that he is the self-expression of God made flesh. A Trinitarian, and so in, in a sense, that's not a distinct person, right? That is made flesh in his flesh, he is distinct, but not, you know, not pre-existently distinct. But here, he says, I declare to you what I've seen in the Father's presence, that prior to his incarnation, maybe, that's what he's talking about, I learned from the Father what the truth was, what the words were, what, this, what, the, what, what, the, uh, what the intent of God is. As for you, you should do what you have heard from the Father. You should be the people that God has have asked you to do in the history of Israel. And they answered him, Abraham is our father. That's their problem, right? That Abraham's their father, God's not their father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing what Abraham did, which was what? Serving the father. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are indeed doing what your father, what your real father does. It gets tough here. And they said to him, we are not illegitimate children. We have one father, God himself. But Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and now I am here. I did not come on my own, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot accept my word. You are from your father, the devil, and you choose to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Whoa. So, speaking of Satan, speaking of the devil, Jesus says that you are following him. He's your father. He's the one that tells you what to speak. He's the one that you do what he wants you to do. Because I tell you the truth, I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. See, uh, there's a great book, maybe I've told you this before, which is, um, oh, what's the name of that book? It doesn't matter. It's about, it's about um, uh, uh, evil being the belief of the, uh, in, a, in the lie, uh, the lie about ourselves. 
that that's what that that's what evil really is. Um, I don't know what you think about the devil, and um, I'm not really concerned about that. Uh, I think that the devil resides in me, and is my selfishness. And if there is a personification of the devil, that's a power out there somewhere. Okay, but I think the that the power of selfishness, the power of my own desire for self gratification, is is plenty powerful. Um, because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin, he asked. Just like he asked of the woman, right, that was caught in adultery. Who is, who con who is it that condemns you? And she says, no one, sir. I said, which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is from God hears the words of God. The reason you do not hear them is that you are not from God. All right? So you want to believe a lie and not the truth. That, the name of that book is People of the Lie by Scott Peck. People of the Lie, great book. I, I would recommend it. Uh, it's scary. It's a scary book about the truth about human nature. People of the Lie. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? And Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. So we're going to finish this off. You'll see that this is all kind of redundant now. It's just a, you say this and I say this. You see it this way, I see it that way. You are blind and you don't see the light. Uh, and that's what he's talking about here. Uh, you, yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. That is the father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever keeps my word will never see death. And the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say, Whoever keeps my word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father who died? The prophets also died. Who do you claim to be? How do you claim to be someone who can bestow eternal life? Abraham and the prophets themselves died. Jesus answered, They say, Who do you claim to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. There is the gospel in a nutshell. If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, he of whom you say he is our God, though you do not know him. But I know him. If I would say that, you, if I would say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. How in the world is he, what in the world is he talking about? It says Abraham lives with the Father, you see. Abraham is, is, has eternal life and understands this. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old. You've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. And so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. So here is Jesus saying that he is greater than Abraham. That he is, essentially he's saying, I'm God, I am divine. And so they picked up stones because he's a blasphemer. He's blaspheming Abraham and he's blaspheming God. And so they're going to kill him. All right. We're going to stop there. And, but, and when we meet next, we'll be uh, in Holy, on Holy Wednesday, uh, the day before Maundy Thursday. Um, bless you. May the Lord bless you and may you have a great Palm Sunday. And may you walk in the light of, uh, of Christ this week just a little more, just a little more. Get to know him a little bit better, and I'll try to, okay? God be with you. Bye-bye.